Let me turn to energy expenditure. I spent a lot of time on intake because I think that's where the predominant driver is, but expenditure is another component. I'm supposed to finish in two minutes. That'll be tricky. Um, you, Merlin, you can, when you want me to shut up, you just say shut up and I'll, I'll be happy to end at any time along the way. Now, this is one of a couple of studies of physical activity. This is a longitudinal study. This is the Pittsburgh component of that in black and white girls during adolescence. You can see that each year as these girls got older from age 9 up to 18, they uh, gradually decreased their energy expenditure. And for the black girls in blue, there's essentially no spontaneous physical activity other than what they have to do to go to school and back in the last few years of this study. But both black and white girls show this decline during adolescence. It's more prom prominent in, in the girls than in boys, but it's present uh, in both sexes. Uh, we know that television plays a role uh, in this problem, and I'm going to jump to one uh, other slide from this institution by Tim Church, which does suggest that the changed work environment contributes to the epidemic of obesity, and I'll give you my estimates of numbers in a moment. What they looked at were the patterns of moderate uh, light and sedentary moderate light activity. You can see in the white that moderate activity between 1960 and 2010 has declined steadily, that uh, sedentary activity has gone up a little bit, uh, and that uh, light activity has gone up more. So our job requirements have changed. Not many people are on the farm anymore. Uh, our big machinery does most of this. It's the service industries that we have, uh, and those don't take much energy, and there's been a clear shift. And my estimates are that about two-thirds to maybe three-quarters of the epidemic is the food intake side, and maybe a quarter is this shifting uh, uh, work-related uh, energy expenditure. So let me talk about the regulatory system. I said I was going to start and put this diagram together. I'll skip some of this, Merlin, because I want to take the larger view for the last few slides. I'll do this in maybe one slide. Um, obesity, I think, is clearly a regulated system. And I think one of the clearest and nicest demonstrations is this drug study with Ramonabant, where the people in green were assigned before the study began to switch at the end of one year to no drug or continue the drug. So that was the randomization. So we're the same group for the first year. But you can see that when the randomizations came into effect and they were randomized to the placebo, the weight gain went, body weight went up and they reached the same level as the orange placebo group had throughout the trial. Those who continued on the medication maintained a lower body weight, meaning to me that this drug can manipulate the uh, the set point or the response elements in this system by about 10%. And drugs that produce weight gain, some of the uh, psychoactive drugs, can increase it by about the same amount. So it looks to me as though there's a roughly 10% variable response in the regulatory system, being able to go up about 10% or down about 10% by various manipulations of this, uh, this type. <coughs> That's Excuse me. Um, the, I missed a slide in here. Boy, oh boy. Let's go back one. There it is. What is all that nice, interesting text over there? I don't really know. Is it, anyway, this is the food intake regulatory system. You can read the text. I'm not even sure I know what it says. But the point is it's got a central component at the top. It's got some feedback regulatory messages from various organs which regulate the energy intake and energy uh, output. And what I wanted to share with you was um, a, a bits of a talk I heard yesterday at Johns Hopkins about the medial forebrain pleasure circuit. And, and, uh, in 1964, a man named Olds, this is back in my early days of my career, I, uh, a, a, and, and Milner, uh, put electrodes in the ventral tegmental area of rodents, uh, which were electrodes that they could self-stimulate if they wished. They had a little bar to press them, and they could press as often as they liked. And what they found was that these animals would consistently and persistently stimulate this area of the brain, that it was a rewarding center. And, and they found that these animals would, if the bar to press it was over here and there was an electric shock field in between, they'd run over that electric shock field to be able to press that bar. Uh, and they found that if they put the, the, the rats in the 
cage with a receptive female, they'd run over and start pressing their bar and ignore the female. It's more powerful drive than sex. Uh, it's more powerful, uh, it allows you to overcome a lot of pain. They found that in the, the female rats that had new pups, the, the, pup, the, the female would abandon her pups to press this bar. So it tells you that this ventral tegmental dopaminergic system that's connected to the nucleus accumbens is an extremely powerful reward system and one that is phylogenetically very old. Uh, uh, Dr. Linden was telling us about the C. elegans, which is a very, this little tiny worm, also appears to have dopaminergic fibers, which can be shown to fire during uh, some feeding responses in these little fellows as well. So it's an ancient system, a powerful system. It's involved in all of the addictive drugs and many addictive behaviors. Gambling, for example, is one where this system is a activated. <clears throat> so I have a couple of points about it, if these come along. Stimulation of this area releases dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which is a pleasurable response. And as I've said, uh, rodents will do a great deal to get this pleasurable stimulation. <clears throat> The circuitry is activated by addictive drugs, alcohol, nicotine, uh, and food. And that's where we come back to us. And I, <clears throat> Merlin, that's actually the question I was starting to lead up to in my question about uh, MRI studies and, and kids. Is this dopaminergic system activated, or is it basically at high levels in the Prader-Willi syndrome? I don't know the answer to that. Obese people have small activation of the pleasure center with the taste of food, but more stimulation of the dopaminergic system with anticipation of food. Very different from normal weight people. It means that they crave the food more, but they like it less. It doesn't produce the same level of stimulation. So to get the same reward from the dopamine system, they require more of it. So it's this liking, wanting uh, issue which this system plays a as, a, as an important component of our system. Um, the rest of the, uh, oh yes, uh, the last one was that this uh, system is activated by sugars and fats, which may have some addictive properties, but that their activation is super additive. That when you have fat and sugar together, you get a greater response of the dopaminergic pleasure reward system than when you have either one in comparable amounts alone. So it's a very important system. Uh, <coughs> the Feedback regulatory system is controlled in the arcuate nucleus. And Merlin, for time, I'm going to just pass over this. I assume you know all these things, so I'm just going to jump down a bit. The second component of the system is the peripheral signals. I've taken this slide from Hans uh, Rudy Berto's uh, work. He does beautiful slides. This is the GI tract on the right side where all those nice little peptides are lined up. There are uh, systems that go up to the hypothalamus uh, where this ventral tegmental area is, among others, that have important relations to food intake. Uh, for time, I'm uh, not going to talk about any of them uh, because I want to do something else, not even leptin. Oh, terrible. Um, the fat is an endocrine organ uh, and makes a whole variety of products. I used to have only a few on the slide, but, but I now have a lot, and they're in a variety of categories. They're metabolic products. There's immune system signals, which we'll come back to in a moment, and matrix messages. In order to change fat cell size, you have to modify the matrix, and there are expression of genes involved with collagen, for example, that are, are uh, readily uh, measurable. <coughs> Let's see if we can see where we're going. Um, there is a clear inflammatory component to obesity related to these cytokines, which may be related to the microbiota in our gut. Uh, and there are uh, two major groups, the bacterioides and the firmicutes, which are 99% of this set of, of, of organisms, which are 10 times as numerous as our cells in our body. So there's uh, 10 times as many bacteria in our gut as there are cells in the body. They seem to be able to modulate uh, our physiological responses in several ways by modifying energy homeostasis, probably by enhancing the digestion of fiber uh, in the colon, by uh, altering gut permeability, which I think is an important component of this. And I want just to drop down to this slide. This is a, a figure I took from a review 
uh, that suggesting that one of the ways in which the microbiome works in the gut is to alter the permeability, allowing lipopolysaccharide, which is the inflammatory component of these organisms, to enter the circulation, and that the inflammatory responses we see may well be a reflection of the altered gut permeability influencing both the uh, inflammatory system as well as some of the uh, metabolic systems. So I think this is an important component of this regulatory system whose uh, final values we don't entirely know. 